Mary wanted me to be sure and thank each and every one of you for your prayers. She says it's the best medicine that anybody could have. Prayers of the saints. Now Moses, in the law, commanded of us that such should be stoned. But what say you? They, this they said, testing him, that he might have something to which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Our text today is John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Those were verses 5 and 6. You know, almost every worldly person knows at least one verse of Scripture. It may be something like Jesus wept, John 11, verse 35. Or it may be, judge not that you be not judged, Matthew 7, verse 1. Even the old drunkard will quote to you 1 Timothy 5, verse 23. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and for your frequent infirmities. You know, the old alcoholic would just dearly love to have the right to do so and biblically prove it. But he has to thwart this scripture in order to do that. What about the sexually immoral? Well, it tells us in John chapter 8 verse 7, so when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. You know, they use this verse to teach that Christians do not have the right to judge and expose sin. And that's contrary to the words of Christ, isn't it? Now I urge you, brethren, note those. If you're in the King James Version, it's mark them who cause division and offense contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. Romans 16, verse 17. Mark them. How are you going to do that if you don't judge? How are you going to mark them if you don't judge them? You know, we mark the good as well as the bad. How can you know their fruit if you don't inspect their fruit? Every tree is known by its own fruit. So we know that each and every person has to make a decision about everything they do in their lives, whether it's right or whether it's wrong. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Philippians 3 verse 17. Paul says we mark Christians just as he told us we need to mark those who cause division in the church and those who teach falsely. We need to inspect their fruit. Every tree is known by its own fruit. Luke 6 verse 44, the A part of that verse. So it's a perversion of this passage to say you can't judge people. Oh, if you're guilty, you can't throw a stone. This reflects a misunderstanding of the matter that Jesus is talking about here. With this lesson, we need to consider the message of John 8, verse 7. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her First, that's the passage that we're concentrating on. We need to start with a preliminary observation. A fundamental principle of biblical interpretation 
Anytime that we're trying to interpret the scripture, we need to remember that you cannot place an interpretation on a particular verse that makes it conflict with or conduct or conflict with other passages in the New Testament. There can be no conflict in the Word of God. Therefore, in such a situation, we're going to have to search for a non conflicted answer to that situation. If you're guilty and you can't throw the first stone, how can you make that judgment about yourself? You just did a, a violate that judge not, you be not judged. And that's what people want to teach today. Satan referred to the scripture in Psalm 91, verses 11, 12, uh, referring to Jesus. He said, For he shall give his angels charge over you, to keep you in all your ways, in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. That's what it reads in Psalms 91, verses 11 and 12. The clause, to keep thee in all thy ways, Satan chose to leave that out because it was unsuitable for his design and his temptation of Jesus. God had promised to protect and support his servants, including us, in midst of no dispute, but as the path of duty is the way of safety, they are entitled to no good when they walk out of the light of the Lord. The Lord says if we keep his commandments, he will protect us. If we don't, we have no right to that protection. Satan said to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Matthew 4, verse 6. Jesus showed that Satan misapplied this verse by pointing to Deuteronomy 6, verse 16. You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in the Massal. Deuteronomy 6 verse 16. Jesus here makes reference to a warning that Moses gave the people of Israel after they tempted God in the Massal desert. That's what he's talking about here. Satan was there and he knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. You can't twist the scripture. And that's what he was doing. Satan's interpretation of Psalm 91 was in conflict with Deuteronomy 6 verse 16. Do not tempt the Lord your God. There are always legal consequences to any proposition where the word of God is twisted. Judge not that you be not judged. What does that mean? Well, in our legal system... It would be impaired. We can't make any judgment about who's right or who's wrong. What's the point of having a legal system if you can't make a judgment? What about uh, a parent trying to correct their child? Well, if you can't judge whether or not your child is right or wrong, and you don't have the right to do that, how's your child going to learn? How's he going to grow in the admonition of the Lord? What about uh, a school teacher? She can't even correct his own papers. Because you'd have to tell the child he was wrong if you were correcting papers, wouldn't you? School teachers could never correct or discipline children. So there's logical consequences in the proposition that these people are teaching. You cannot judge. What about Paul? Paul was a man of high moral character. But Paul was not sinless, was he? Romans 7 verse 19 For the good that I would to, will to do, I do not. But the evil that I will not to do, that I practice. In other words, we all sin from time to time. Even though we intend to do good, we will sin from time to time. Romans 7 verse 19 Paul says, but I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. 
1 Corinthians 9, verse 27. Paul knows he sins. Paul does his very best to ensure that he does not sin. And he preaches and teaches the word of God as best he can. Well, what does he do about it? Well, Philippians 3, verses 12 through 14 says, Not that I have already obtained, but I am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of for me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul is doing his extremely best to live a Christian life. His extreme best. He became a Christian, Paul did. And he does not hesitate to rebuke those who are in sin, knowing himself he also is a sinner. He does not hesitate to rebuke others. If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or a spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. If you're violating the things I write, you're violating what the Lord says. He's rebuking people for doing that. Paul would not tolerate sin in anyone, especially those who watch but ignore the Word of God. It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And such sexual immorality is not even named among the Gentiles. That a man has his father's wife. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. 1 Corinthians 5 verses 1 and 2. It's as if the people in that congregation was enjoying watching this individual work his eternal life into hell. And they were doing nothing to help or correct or rebuke this individual in sin. But Paul didn't hesitate to do so in front of the entire congregation. Thus in Paul we see a sinful man by God's authority rebuke other sinful men. How does that coincide with judge not that you be not judged you know with Paul it was not a willful impenitent senator because he became a Christian Acts 22 verses 6 through 16 he knows that he sinned from time to time but he is a penitent sinner when he sins he prays and asks for forgiveness it's not wrong for one that's striving to be righteous to rebuke one impenitently continuing in grievous sin as was this man who had another man's wife but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us from all sin you know, we cannot put any other interpretation on John 8, verse 7 that contradicts the teachings of the Scripture. We must judge people. We must make judgments about ourselves. And so that's not the reason that the people left. John 8 verse 7 does not teach that it's wrong to expose sin or to rebuke other people's sin as you see it. So when they continued to ask him, he raised himself up and he said, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Let's consider what the situation is here in John 8. See if it will help us understand what Jesus was actually teaching. Now early in the morning, he came again into the temple. 
And all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned. What say you? What say you? What's the situation? Well, the previous day Jesus had been teaching and he returned to the temple again today. And there's a controversy stirred up. While he was teaching, a group of scribes and Pharisees came dragging a woman in before him. And they threw her down and said, This woman was taken in adultery, and the law taught that she should be stoned. What's going on here? What's the point of all of this action? Well, the crowd would agree that Deuteronomy 22 verse 22 says she should be stoned. If a man is found lying with a woman married to a husband, then both of them shall die. The man that lay with the woman and the woman so you shall put away evil from Israel. The scribes were right. The law does say she needs to die. The purpose of the action, though, was to set a trap for Jesus, wasn't it? Was it not their concern for the law and for justice? No. They were very insincere with what they were doing. Their actions say they were not concerned about the law. They were not concerned about the justice. They designed a trap to place Christ in a politically difficult position. Or at least great difficulty with the people. Knowing that the people would have to agree with the law. Stoner. If he said stoner, what would happen? He would be in trouble with the Roman government, wouldn't he? Because only the Roman government could issue a death sentence at that time. If they did not stone her, Jesus would be accused of having no respect for the law. So you see, the trap was set. And it was sprung. And Jesus needed to do what they wanted him to do, in their opinion. But Jesus said nothing. He just stooped down and started writing in the dust. Then they said to him that they might have something with which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Verse 6 of chapter 8. Jesus said nothing and then wrote in the dust. This is the only passage that reveals... Jesus has the ability to write. The only one. Why is there nothing written by him still here today? Why do we not have papers and things that Jesus wrote? Well, man tends to idolize relics, don't they? And they would have minimized other scriptures, other inspired scriptures, just so they could worship at this written document, whatever it may be. So we have no writings from Jesus as such. And many of the things were revealed after he left. So he could not have written at all. They said to him, testing that they might have something to accuse him of. And then he wrote on the ground. And uh, men today still want answers to everything that they think that they want to do rather than what the Bible says. So they pressed Jesus for an answer. They needled him until he would stand up and do something. Jesus said, He who is without sin among you, let him throw the first stone at her. You know, the law stated that the accuser must cast the first stone, didn't it? The hands of the witness shall be the first against him to put him to death. And afterwards, the hands of all the people 
so shall you put away the evil from you. Deuteronomy 17, verse 7. Stoning. And the first witness gets to throw that first stone. Absolutely must. Again, Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground, John 8, verse 8. And the people began to peel away, starting with the oldest all the way down to the youngest. They started leaving the situation. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. John 8 verse 9. It's just Jesus and the woman now. Look at the insincerity of the Jews. We had scribes here. They were experts in the law of Moses. They knew exactly what was supposed to happen when they did what they did. The Pharisees, they were the straightest of the sects. But they were still in cahoots with the scribes trying to set a trap for Jesus. They did not do as they should have done, which is take the woman to the Sanhedrin. There was the place of proper authority. But no, they wanted to take it to Jesus to set a trap for him. They did not bring the guilty man with them either, did they? They said caught in the very act, which means the man was there present. But yet they let him go. Could he have been one of them? And they had set this up and contrived this trap for Jesus? We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But it does tell us they didn't bring the man. Because he also would have to die according to the law. In the act dictates that both parties were actively participating. So where was the man? In their hypocrisy, they didn't bring him. They didn't think that they would need him. Thus the one who claims that they wanted to uphold the law were themselves violating the law. Hypocrites. They were not worthy of bringing the accusation. In the context alone, this is the only way that we can view what Jesus is talking about here. He's not saying, judge not that you be not judged. But you better not be hypocrites while you're doing it. You better know who you are and that your soul is right with the Lord. And then you can be a fruit inspector. You can check the fruit of those around you. Jesus spoke to the woman. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one with a woman, he said to her, Woman, where are the accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? In verse 10. Where are those accusers? Neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. He didn't refrain from recognizing her as a sinner. He knew she was a sinner. She was caught in the act of adultery. Did he condemn her? No, but he certainly gave her a judicial sentence, didn't he? Sin no more. That applies to all of us in everything we do. When we have forgiveness, we need to sin no more. Not continue in what we were doing in the past. No condemnation, but a judicial sentence was given to this woman by the Lord. What are the important truths that we can learn well, the charged woman committed a despicable act. Hebrews 13, verse 4. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Each and every one of us, as we do wrong, the Lord will judge us. All Christians are to abandon their sinful ways, their sinful worldly ways. And do not be conformed to this world, but be yet transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's the kind of life that we need to live. 
a life that Christ can look at us and say, that is the perfect will of my Father. Romans 12, verse 2. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, but in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Each and every one of us needs to strive for that holy conduct in our lives. And do not condone sin, but have compassion for the sinner just as Jesus did for that woman. James 5 verses 19 through 20. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the errors of his ways saves a soul from certain death, and it covers a multitude of sin. James 5, verses 19 through 20. We need that compassion for sinners, but not an excuse, and not just stand by and let them continue. We need to take action. We cannot... Let people get by with abusing the Bible. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause defense and division and offense, contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the simple. Romans 16, verses 17 and 18. It is so easy to deceive those who do not know the Word of God. That's why they're called the simple. But they need to study and they need to be taught and we need to be out there teaching them and doing what needs to be done. Each and every one of us knows that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We also know that he who believes and is baptized will be saved. We also know that we must repent of our sins. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Or do you not know that as many of you as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Having done so, you must remain faithful until death, when which he says, I will give you the crown of life. Revelation 2 verse 10b. Prayerful penance for an erring child of God is required. Acts 8, verse 22, the second law of pardon. Repent therefore of this your wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thoughts of your heart may be forgiven you. Now is the time to judge yourself. Make that judgment whether or not you are in Christ. If you're not, make it a point to be in Christ. The invitation call is for you whether you need the first law of pardon or the second law of pardon. Now is the time while we stand and sing.